everybody's got an opinion, especially nowadays. We're surrounded by a constant clamor of hot takes and, and soapbox dances, yet these voices are often lacking the very thing we most crave, wisdom. As we grapple with the weighty issues of our day, let's find answers from the man who has enlightened hundreds of generations and still speaks today. What does Jesus say about hard times and racism? What does he say about hypocrisy, the end times and burnout? Join us as we turn to Jesus and listen to his words to find help and hope. Well, it's great to see everybody here today, and it's great to have those of you I can't see, whether you're at the McKinney campus or uh, attending our online campus. I hope you enjoyed your extra hour of sleep last night. It was awesome. This is my favorite weekend of the year, so... Uh, Thanks for joining us. And I'm excited about the topic today. What does Jesus say about the end times? And you know, whenever there's a lot of upheaval or tumult in a world, it's like people's interest in the end times really begins to escalate. And I think right now with COVID and racial unrest and election time, I think we probably qualify for a few people uh, thinking about the end times, right? And quite frankly, our culture has been enamorated with the apocalypse for quite a while. And you actually pick this up in all the movies that have been made uh, focusing on the apocalypse. Like here are a couple, maybe some of your favorites. Uh, here's the first one, Armageddon, you know, Bruce Willis. Uh, the world is going to be destroyed. The end is going to come because of a great asteroid. And if it's not an asteroid, it's going to be you know, climate warming, you know, climate change and water world. And then here's one that really perhaps strikes a little too close to home, outbreak. It's going to be a pandemic that gets us. But here's my least favorite way the world would end would be in a zombie war. I just, zombies kind of give me the creeps. I would hate for that to happen. And then there's Arnold, uh, you know, the Terminator. Computers take over everything. And with art, artificial intelligence, what it is today, who knows? It could be the Terminator. But listen, it's not just our secular culture. Uh, even Christians get on, in on the act. And so we have our movie, Left Behind, with the famous Kirk uh, Cameron. And then if you got left behind the first time, you could actually get it a second time uh, through Nicolas Cage. And so all of these things are really pointing to a great interest that we have in the end times. But today, we're going to really be focusing on what Jesus has to say about them and here's the goal for my message today, is to help you get a clear understanding of Jesus' teaching about the end of time so that you'll be compelled to live a faithful and fruitful life in this present time. Now, actually, there are two factors that make it difficult for us to really get a clear understanding of the end times. And here's the first one. There are people, both now and in the past, who peddle end times prophecies for personal gain. Now, this is actually not new. It goes back at least until Jesus' time. In fact, in Mark chapter 13, when Jesus is talking about these end times, here's what he has to say. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs, and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. Now, Jesus understood, and I think we should understand, that the apocalypse sells. You know, even Hal Lindsey, in his book, The Late Great Planet Earth, it sold over 70 million copies. And the Left Behind series, which is based on that theology in that book, also has sold over 70 million copies. So no wonder people from time to time will recognize that, hey, if I make this the centerpiece of my ministry, I can gather a following for myself. I can sell some books or I can gain some money through a movie, whatever the case is. But many times, a clear understanding of the end times is really muddied by people who are teaching and misleading us about the real truth, all right? Now, here's the second reason that we're often struggling to get a clear uh, word, is there are people who make the Bible's teachings about end times a puzzle to be solved 
rather than a promise to be shared. Kind of throughout history, there have been Bible scholars and Bible students who scour the book of Daniel or Ezekiel or Revelation to try to come up with exactly when the end times will come. Even though in Matthew 24, 36, Jesus says, nobody knows when that time will be, not even the angels in heaven. I don't even know when it's going to happen. But still, people keep predicting. As a matter of fact, Pat Robertson predicted just two weeks ago that Trump is going to be elected. There will be five years of civil disobedience, and then an asteroid is going to come and destroy the earth. So who knew? Bruce Willis was right. In Armageddon, that's the way it's going to end. Now, in the spirit of full disclosure, Pat Robertson also predicted that 1982 would be the, the last time too. So here's the, why do we continue to do this? And some scholars, like this guy by the name of J.N. Darby, back in the middle of the 1800s, he put, to, uh, put together a scheme uh, out, outlining that there's going to be a rapture, uh, and then tribulation will come, and then Jesus is going to come back for a second time, come a second rapture, and then the thousand-year reign will happen, then judgment. And so that created all kinds of controversy and discussion around is there going to be a tribulation? When is it going to happen? Is there going to be one rapture, two raptures? I mean, there's a seminary in Dallas just based solely on this whole perspective, all right? And then along with that goes, well, hey, we got to find out other things too, like, you know, during the tribulation, there's going to be the beast, 666, right? And so who is the beast? Well, it's really interesting how many times Christians try to identify who the beast is. Like in history, uh, some people thought, well, like our social security numbers would be the mark of the beast because we'll all be marked with the beast. Uh, if it's not social security numbers, it's barcodes. Barcodes are going to be the mark of the beast. Now, personally, I heard, I was, I was around for this, I heard that Ronald Reagan was the beast, the mark of the beast. You know why? Because Ronald Wilson Reagan all have six letters in all of his names. So he's the mark of the beast, right? So, or he is the beast. And so now we have most... You know, most recently that Bill Gates is going to use COVID-19 uh, to insist that there's a vaccine mandate, but you're not going to get just a, va a vaccine. You're going to get a computer chip and we're all going to be marked by the beast. Now, if that wasn't simply humorous, it would, if it wasn't so dangerous, it would be humorous, but it's not because every time Christians go against Jesus and and project a date or try to figure out the solution to this puzzle, we subject the gospel to ridicule. And we lose credibility with the very people we're trying to reach because they think we're crazy for doing this. And it makes me want to stop and think, well, what do you really get if you guess the date or you get all the rapture stuff right? You know, you know, when we all gather for the great banquet at the end of times, is there going to be a section on the program when Jesus gives out awards for everyone who gets it right? You know, our award this thing, you know, our award this eternity for the one who guessed closest to the date. Come on up and let me give you your award. Really? Or what about the award for the people or the seminary who gets all the right rapture, you know, millennial right? You know, you guys, come on up. You got it all right. What do you, there's nothing to be gained from that. And as a matter of fact, what happens out of that come discussions that often lead to divisions, which leads to all kinds of distractions from the real meaning and purpose of the message of the end times. And so we're going to focus on what Jesus says. And in Mark chapter 13, we already read this verse, verse 23. I want to read it again. Here's what Jesus is saying to the disciples. And a lot of people miss this. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. What Jesus is saying is that everything you need to know about the end times, I'm telling you right now, you don't need the four beasts and the ten horns of Daniel, or you don't need to know who the bear from the north is. I'm telling you everything that you need to know. So we're going to focus our time today on exactly what Jesus says about the end time. And if you'd like to read more in depth, I want to suggest to you, you take a look at some chapters of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew chapter 24 and 25, the most extensive teaching in the Gospels about the end times. Mark 13, 
and Luke 21. Now, when you begin to read these, Jesus is responding to a question from the disciples, and they ask, Lord, when will the temple be destroyed? You prophesied that not one stone would be on another, and when will the end come? And Jesus prophesies that there will be an end to the temple, and in AD 70, it happened. And it was a horrific experience. Jesus prophesied it. 1.1 million Jews were killed. Horrible. But then he goes on and talks about the end times. And that's going to be our focus today. And when he talks about those things, he says there are just three things that you really need to know. Three things will get you to the end in really good shape. And so here they are. The first of the three things is this. He will return in great glory and he will gather all believers to himself to be with him forever. Matthew records Jesus' words this, this way in verses 30 through 31. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Let me say something about this right now. When Jesus came the first time, he came in obscurity and in poverty. He snuck into our existence, and the only people who noticed it were a bunch of sleepy shepherds, and they had to be cued in by the, by the choir of angels, right? Very low-key. But this time, he's coming in. It's going to be big. It's going to be grand. Everybody's going to see it and know it. And he will send out his angels with a mighty blast of a trumpet. Now, a trumpet blast has three things involved. First of all, you use a trumpet to wake people up. Get ready. Be alert. Something's about to happen. A trumpet also signifies someone of royalty who is coming, someone of great power coming in. And then third, the trumpet sounds of an army coming to the rescue. Christ is coming back to rescue his people. No more suffering, no more loss. Evil will be reckoned with, justice will be done, and all things will be made new. And he will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and the heavens. All people from all parts, all times will be gathered to him. Now, here's something I don't want you to miss. In this coming, Jesus is the draw. He doesn't mention anything about streets of gold and gates of pearl. He doesn't even talk about the great reunion we'll have with our loved ones, those kinds of things, because Jesus is the draw of the second coming. Now, let me give you an earthly example of the kind of draw I'm talking about. For three years, Matt Rule was the head football coach at Baylor. I wish he were still the coach. He has now gone on to be the coach of the Carolina Panthers, but he is one of the finest leaders of men I have ever observed. His ability to cast vision, the kinds of values that he lived by, he was relentlessly committed to the mission of winning, and yet he was incredibly humble. He always deferred credit to those around him, and he always took the blame when things went wrong. He made serving with him, being on his team, something that was joyful and fun, and they won, and it was great to be a part of it. Now, here's the deal. I know I'm way too old and slow to be a part of the team, but you know what? I would have washed socks and jocks for him. I would have been a water boy just to be close to him, to be a part of what's going on, to soak up his wisdom. Now, with that in mind, just think about when Jesus comes back. Jesus is the one who exemplifies relentless commit, commitment to his mission. That is, he died in the service of redeeming you and me and all of creation. He comes in power, and yet he's incredibly humble. And he's created a kingdom, a kingdom made up of the power of love. And he invites us to come along with him and join him in his mission of redeeming and reconciling everything back to God. And he empowers us to use our gifts and our abilities to join him in all of this. And we have the privilege of serving him. Now, you know, I don't qualify to do a whole lot, but if I can just be the lowliest of servants, I just want to be with him and be on his team and do what he's doing because it matters and it lasts. So when Jesus comes again, he's coming. He's going to gather all of us together and he's the draw because we want to be with him and near him and a part of what he's doing in the world. I hope that's what gives you great hope about the second coming. Here's the second thing he says. When he comes, he will judge everyone. After he comes, then the judgment. 
And he will judge everyone, would-be believers, true believers, and non-believers alike. Now, judgment is an expression of the justice of God. And if I were honest with myself, I probably don't talk enough about judgment. That is the fact that there will be a reckoning for history for every one of us. Because you see, unless there is judgment, grace doesn't mean anything. Unless we fully comprehend that apart from Jesus, we would stand in judgment of God and it's because of his love and grace that we now will be able to move through judgment into the next life, right? Now, there are several things that Jesus teaches about judgment. And uh, there are four stories uh, that he talks about uh, in the end parts of Matthew 24 and all of Matthew 25. And let me tell you just a little bit about those stories. One is a story of two servants. One is very uh, diligent in his work, and he serves his master well. The other servant, he's part of what God is doing, that is, you know, he's working for the master. He doesn't think the master is going to hold him accountable too much, and so he starts beating the help, and he also spends a lot of time partying and getting drunk. Well, the master comes back, he promotes the good servant, and he fires the bad servant in the worst kind of way, okay? That's one story. The second story is, it is the parable of 10 bridesmaids. Bridesmaids were chosen to be a part of the wedding party and their role was to welcome, to wait upon the groom and to help start the big celebration. It so happens in this story, the groom is delayed and there are the bridesmaids waiting for him, but five of the bridesmaids, they brought extra oil so their lamp wouldn't go out, but five of the bridesmaids, they were so caught up in how cool it was to be a part of the wedding party and they weren't really thinking about what the real role was and so they ran out of oil and then the bridegroom shows up and so they're going, hey, 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 can we borrow some oil? And they go, no, if we give you our oil, we won't have any. And so, hey, go to the all-night circle K, and maybe you can get some. Well, while they're away getting oil, the bridegroom comes. The party starts. They come back. Knock, knock, knock. Let us in. The bridegroom goes, hey, sorry, you were late. You missed it. And by the way, I don't know who you are. Then there's a story of the parable of the talents. Three servants. Master gives three of them an ungodly amount of money. Says, I'm going away. I'm entrusting it to you. You decide what to do with this incredible opportunity. But I will come back and you'll have to give it an account of how you used it. And so the first two servants, they have watched the master. They have looked at how he invests and how he manages. And so they go out and they double their money almost immediately. But the third servant, well, he's kind of skeptical of the master. He thinks he's harsh. He thinks he's overbearing. So he simply digs a hole and hides his money. And when the master comes back, he promotes the two who double their money and he fires in the worst way the one who hid. And then there's the last story, the story of the separation of the sheep and the goats, all the great judgment. Everyone and all the creation will be there and he will divide up people. Some will be in the sheep pen, others will be in the goat pen. It's not going to be good to be in the goat pen. And he says, This is the qualification. When I was hungry, you fed me. And when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you took me in. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you came and cared for me. When I was in prison, you visited me. And on that basis, you're either in or you're out. All right, Whew. that's a lot of stuff right there, right? Now, here's the thing. Those five stories tell us several things about judgment. The person one is this, that is judgment will reveal our true selves our true selves will be revealed. In 1 Corinthians 4, 5, the apostle Paul writes, don't make judgment about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns, for he will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. Then God will give to each one whatever praise is due. So let's talk about would-be believers and true believers and non-believers. Now, would-be believers are those who live a life of faith for self's sake. Like the unfaithful servant, like the lazy five bridesmaids, like the skeptical servant in the parable of the talents, and like the goats. That is, if you are living a life of faith simply for self's sake, what that means is you even make all your religious activity about you. Hey, hey, God has saved me. He's forgiven me all my sins. I punched my ticket to heaven and not hell. Hey, he's going to get me out of the binds that I get myself in. It is really all about me. My faith is only transactional. 
I do this, I get this back from God. It never turns to a, a full-on gratitude for the one who made that possible for you. A life of faith of a would-be believer is a transactional way of living. Now, a true believer has a different perspective. True believers are those who live a life of faith for Christ's sake. Now, here's what that means. It means that, yes, we have received all the benefits of God's forgiveness and his love and his grace, but we haven't simply received it. We have been ruined by it because we recognize how undeserving we are. We recognize how gracious he was. And so because of that, we're actually willing to reorder our life around him and his desires and his hopes for us. Now, there's a wonderful passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, where the Apostle Paul really uh, speaks about this very clearly. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves, would-be believers. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. You see, true believers can sing wholeheartedly I love you, Lord. Your mercy has never failed me. All the days of my life, I have been held in your hand. And from the time when I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. That is, their faith is not transactional. It is now relational and focused on Jesus. And then, Non-believers, non-believers are those who have failed to trust in this good news of Jesus. And whenever they have experienced him by hearing the message or seeing him in creation or that intuitive sense that comes to us many times deep in the, our consciences or even in the lives of others, they have said, no, thank you. Not now. Not interested. And Jesus says, for those who say that, when the end comes... There will be great mourning and sorrow because they missed it. So here's what happens. Judgment is going to reveal our true nature. And second, his judgment is going to be final. His judgment will be final. In Matthew 25, verses 11 through 12, we have a snippet of the story of the ten bridesmaids. Now later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. And this is one of the most sobering parts of the good news is that it can be too late. That is, we have the privilege and it is an awesome privilege to decide in this life about the good news and the grace of God in a way that will determine our eternity for the future. It's really important that we understand that, that judgment is final. Our decisions are our destiny. And it's really important as you think about how you respond to Jesus and how you turn to him and how you live your life for him, it's gonna be really important to you to be on the side of eternity. You know, in our culture today, when it comes to a lot of social issues, we say, well, I don't wanna end up on the wrong side of history. Well, that is true, but more importantly, you don't want to end up on the wrong side of eternity. And that's why we have to recognize that Jesus is saying judgment is final and how we respond is really important. Here's the next thing he says about judgment. His judgment will indeed be fair. You know, when you decide that Jesus is saying, hey, judgment is final in this life, well, then you start thinking about all the people who have never heard. They've never heard the story of Jesus. What about them when the judgment comes? Now, if, if almost half the world has never heard of him, what does that say? Does that say, well, God has a really bad marketing plan? He just didn't get the plan out? Or does that mean he really doesn't want those people to be saved? But what if there is a way in which he really reaches out and touches everybody? And there's some commentators who believe that the parable of the sheep and the goats is actually speaking to this very issue. Matthew 25, 37 through 40, I think hints at that. 
Then to the righteous ones, he will reply. Uh, then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick and in prison and in visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Now, when you look at this story, it almost is saying, you feel like it's saying, hey, listen, we're going to be judged to be in the sheep pen or the goat pen based on our works. But what Jesus is saying is this, is that how you and I treat the least of these is a genuine reflection of what we think about Jesus. Because if we love Jesus and we wrap our arms and our life around who he is, we will love like he loves and we will love who he loves and so we will care for the least. So what Jesus is saying is to us, if you don't care for the least, then in reality you don't care or love me. But what he says in this particular part of the story is that there will be people, many of the sheep will say, hey Lord, when did we ever do that? We did not see you there. And I do believe that it's possible that what he might be saying is, even though you didn't actually know the gospel, for, for those people who care for the least, who feed the hungry, and the, give water to the thirsty, and care for the strangers, that they may be judged on the basis of how they received Jesus in others. Even, then they did, even though they did not know Jesus. Now here's the thing. I, I can't say for 100% certain that that's what Jesus was saying, but here's what I do know. I do believe that judgment is final, but I also believe that God and Jesus is gracious. His death atones not simply for our sins, John says in his letter, first chapter two, verse two, but for the sins of the whole world. But we can count on it that he will be gracious. Now, there's one last thing. He wants us to remember, we have to live every day like it is the day he returns. Your future depends on it. Almost on every occasion, Jesus says, be alert, watch out. You don't know when the date is. It's really important that you live every day ready. I love the way Jesus wraps up the story of the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, verse 21. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I'll give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Now, I love uh, the way this parable portrays life. In essence, what God does is he gives to each one of us uh, this ungodly opportunity, a windfall of life itself. And he gives us abilities he gives us gifts. He gives us opportunities. And he's saying to each one of us, here, I've made you, I've created you. You have all of this. Now go and build a life, shape a life based on me and my truths and who I am. And one day, you can, you're, you're free to make some choices. And all you have to remember is that one day, I'm going to come back and you have to give an account of the life that you've built and shaped. And then when that time comes, uh, that's when we find out our, our future. If you're like that third servant and you receive this incredible gift, well, you were somewhat skeptical of the master. You disrespected him. You were cynical about him. You thought he was over demanding. And so you really turned your back on him and you just hid your gift. And then you just lived your life for yourself and no one else. Then the future for you will be the worst conceivable. But on the other hand, if you love the master and watch the master and live by the master's wisdom and you shaped your life around his values and around his hope, when the end comes and you stand before him, you're able to go, Lord, Lord, look at the life that I've made. Thank you for all that you've given me. And then he's gonna say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in some small things. I'm gonna give you front row seats to a, a church service for eternity. No, he's not gonna do that. He said, I'm gonna promote you 
to a new place in my galactic enterprise of creating and redeeming and maintaining all things, you're getting a big raise. That's what he's saying. You're going to have more responsibility. That's why I love what Dallas Willard says. When he's thinking about eternity, he says, we should think of our destiny as being absorbed in a tremendously creative team effort that is the church of Jesus Christ all working together with unimaginably splendid leadership. We're going to be led by the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit on an inconceivably vast plane. We're, be- we're here in North Texas trying to lead people to Jesus, but now we're going to be in way expansive places doing that. And then he says, with ever comprehensive cycles of productivity and enjoyment. Oh my gosh. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has in store for those who love him. And he doesn't want you to miss it. He really doesn't. And so, as you think about this fact that one day he will come and gather his people to himself, and then there will be the judgment, will you be ready? Will you be prepared? Will you be living a life of faith for Christ's sake? Now, even as I say those words, it may excite in you some feelings of fear. I'm not sure I'm ready. I'm not sure my life of faith is not more about me than it is about Jesus. Or maybe you're just so excited you can't wait because uh, you just live every day in the knowledge of the goodness of God. But what I want to do as we close the service today is to give you an opportunity to do some business with God and to really think honestly and clearly about where you stand right now in relation to the end time. He's inviting you. He wants to include you. I can't think of a better way to really think about and think through this big life decision than by taking the Lord's Supper together. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26, he, he lays out what the supper was really all about. He says, I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, do this to remember me as often as you drink it. And then Paul adds something. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. That there's a connection between taking this because it reminds us of his incredible sacrifice. And it calls from us a faith a life of faith based on his sake. Surrender to him, offered to him on a regular basis. So in these quiet moments, as you carefully lift off the clear cellophane top to expose the bread and then the next layer to expose the drink, I want to ask you just to hold these things in your hand for a moment and to ask yourself this question, am I ready? What is my faith? in relationship to the end times and allow God to speak to you in the inner recesses of your heart, maybe even through this, his supper. This bread represents the body of Christ broken for you and me. And this cup represents his blood shed for our forgiveness so that we indeed can live a new life, a life for Christ's sake. Father, thank you for your immeasurable grace. Thank you that you want our love for you, our commitment to you to be based on our genuine understanding of how 
good and gracious and loving you are. And Father, I pray that this small remembrance of your deep love for us will call us to lay down our lives, to offer our whole selves to you, and live our lives for you, shape our lives around you, so that one day when we stand before you, we can lift up our arms and say, Lord, here's my life. This is what I offer you. I'm so grateful for all you've done for me. And Father, I pray that everyone in my hearing will be able to hear from him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in some small things. I'm gonna give you many more responsibilities in the age to come. Father, that's my prayer for myself. My prayer for each of us this day in Jesus' name. Amen.